Welcome everybody to day eight of PCMI USS. Uh, we now have a new speaker, Dustin Clausen, who will continue Akil's uh, lectures, or maybe it will be completely different. We'll see. <laughs> and uh, let me remind you that today we have another cross program session, Modular Origami by Glenn Whitney. And um, I again I encourage you to go for that. That is at one o'clock to 6 p.m. All right, Dustin, go ahead. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to, yeah, in some sense, continue where Akil left off, but also in another sense, start a, a different thread of topics. Um, can everyone see the sheet of paper where it says Lecture 8, Hilbert Reciprocity? Yes. Um, so, well, let me just give a, a brief recap of what we've seen so far in the course, and then I'll say what we're, get, what we're gonna do. So um, up to now, what kind of stuff have we been talking about? Well, one major topic was the theory of quadratic forms um, over general fields. So we had things like uh, Witt's theorems and so on. Um, you know, every quadratic form can be diagonalized, and then there's a certain set of moves for going between the uh, diagonalizations of the same form. Um, so about so classification of quadratic forms, what you can say over a completely general field. But then we also saw um, some things for certain more specific fields. Um, so we saw for finite fields, uh, for example, FP, um, we gave the classification. And that was uh, fairly simple. And we also saw for um, p-adic numbers or real numbers, um, or more generally local fields, uh, we also gave cl the classification. And so what about from now on, what are we going to be talking about? Um, well, broadly speaking, from now on, we'll be doing number theory. And that, well, the simplest way of saying what that means is, well, more or less, our main object of interest, is, our field of interest is gonna be the rational numbers. Um, and we want to explore the, the features that arise when you take the rational numbers. And in fact, later on, we'll take, later on in my lectures, we won't take the rational numbers anymore. We'll get even more basic, so to speak. Uh, we'll, we will take the non-field, <laughs> Um, it's not a field, right? But we'll be looking at quadratic forms over the integers instead. And then there are some quite interesting phenomena that arise, um, which distinguish it greatly from the case of the, the rational numbers. Um, so, um, and, but, but it, the work that we did in the, of course, in the first half will not be in vain. And in fact, there's a important general principle, um, a general principle in number theory. Um, which is roughly speaking, that says to, to study the rational numbers, you should first study uh, the Q, you know, the, it's non-trivial completions. So the p-adic numbers and the real numbers, uh, then, then see how they fit together. And what we're gonna be doing in these first few lectures is sort of this general principle um, applied to the case of quadratic forms. Um, but uh, more specifically, uh, we're going to take up the discussion of Hilbert symbols that uh, Kiel left off with. Um, so, well, that's something that we had for QP and R, and now we'd like to see how they fit together over the rational number numbers. So let me just give a brief recap of, of Hilbert symbols. Um, so, um, if you have A and B, two non-zero p-adic numbers, um, then you can asso associate to this a sign denoted A comma B sub QP. Um, so it lives in the two element abelian group of uh, signs. Um, and it's defined by, uh, it's plus one if, well, a certain quadratic form is um, isotropic, 
And just to write that concretely, it, it's uh, ax squared plus by squared equals z squared uh, has a solution which is not equal to the trivial solution, 0, 0, 0. Um, and it's equal to minus 1 otherwise. So that's the definition. Um, and, then, uh, and then you do the exact same thing uh, uh, for R replacing QP. So you do it for all the non-trivial completions of Q. Uh, those are parameterized by prime numbers P. And then the usual absolute value you're giving the real numbers is Akil discussed in one of his lectures. And the definition of the Hilbert symbol is uniform if you write it this way. Um, but then there's the question of how to calculate it. And that's something we also saw. And you break it up into three cases. One, the first case uh, is the case where P is odd. Um, and then I'm going to write the formula for it in a slightly different way than Akil did. Um, but then uh, A, B, Q, P can actually be calculated uh, in terms of the p adic valuations of A and B. So it's minus one to, uh, well, not just in terms of that, but using that. Valuation of A times the valuation of B um, multiplied by, and then you take, okay, a funny thing. So you take A raised to the power given by the valuation of B and divide it by B raised to the power of the valuation of A. Um, and then note that these two things here, A to the valuation of B and B to the valuation of A, have the same valuation. Because uh, in both cases, um, it's the valuation of A times the valuation of B. Um, so when you take their quotient, it has uh, valuation 0, which means it's a p-adic integer. All right, well, a p-adic unit, in fact. Um, and in particular, you can reduce it mod p and ask whether or not it's a square mod p. So you take the Legendre symbol of the residue of, uh, so this, this thing uh, lives in ZP cross. Um, you take the Legendre symbol of the residue of this thing mod P and that's, that gives you a sign plus or minus one and then you multiply it by this sign here. Um, and that is a, a formula for the, one way of, it's the equivalent way of writing um, the formula for the Hilbert symbol when, when P is odd. Um, and I should just recall that I, here, so VX, this is the p uh, valuation of uh, the p number x. So in other words, if you write x as, so in other words, you pull out as many factors of p as you can, so to speak, although could, exponent can be positive or negative. So this is an integer. Um, uh, so that what's left is a, uh, a p attic unit, uh, so a unit in the p attic integers. So it has uh, no p's left in it, um, right? So that's the general formula for odd prime p. And now I just want to make a couple of remarks about this. So that the two important special cases of this formula uh, for when p is odd. So, um, so let me give an exam example, which Akil also talked about, but it's going to be important, so I'll remind you of it. So if, if a and b are indeed units in zp, so they're unit p-adic integer units, uh, then uh, the Hilbert symbol is uh, is equal to plus one. And this is because, um, well, then this, this is the same thing as saying uh, V of A is the same as V of B is the same as zero. Um, so the p-adic valuation is zero. And then you just see that all the relevant terms um, just drop out. Um, everything becomes trivial. And Akhil also gave a direct argument for this in his lecture. Um, so that's one example. And another example is that, uh, so if, if A is in ZP cross, and then we take B equals P. So in other words, if we're looking at A comma P, Q, P, then this exactly gives the uh, Legendre symbol of the A, A module. Well, you take A modulo P, A lives in ZP cross. You take it modulo P, you get something in FP cross. And then you take the Legendre symbol of that. And that's a plus or minus one. This is a plus or minus one, and they're the same. So in some sense, the Hilbert symbol uh, can be written in terms of the Legendre symbol. Um, but it also recovers the Legendre symbol when you input this simple input here. Um, so, yeah, okay. And then um, now let me make an important remark. Um, so, uh, you know, th this, this thing here is not true uh, for P equals two. So this property that if there are two, if, there, if it's a p-adic integer unit, 
then the Legendre, uh, the Hilbert symbol is trivial is not true for p, uh, p equals two. In fact, uh, if a and b are in uh, z2 cross, then you can you can write a formula for a b comma q2, and it's not complicated, but it is also non-trivial. So it's minus one to the a minus one over two times b minus one over two. Um, and also, if uh, uh, we can also give the analog of the second formula, but for uh, p equals two, uh, it's some, just slightly more complicated. So you take a squared minus one, um, this will be divisible by eight, so you can divide it by eight and you still get a, uh, well, um, a two attic integer. And then you can take minus one to that power. So, oh no, I realized I, I, uh, the sun just came out in Copenhagen, a very rare occurrence, which I did not anticipate. <laughs> so I'll have to just uh, close the blinds. Um, All right. Um, right. So, and in fact, there's also a general formula you can write down for the Hilbert symbol, but it actually it'll be enough for us to know these two special cases. Um, it involves, it's somehow a combination of these two in general. Um, okay, and that's, so that's all we'll need to know about the two attic Hilbert symbol. And then let me also just recall for the real numbers that ABR is equal to minus one if and only if uh, both a and b are negative. So, and otherwise, it's it's plus one. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Any questions about that um, that recap of what Akil talked about? A little bit tough for me to keep an eye on the chat, but I assume Akil is doing. Uh, yes, uh, Eleftherios. Uh, thank you. So I was I was wondering in the formula that you wrote for the for Q two and for the two attic unit, you yes. in the exponent you have a minus one over two, for example. What what would this expression mean for for a two? What do you mean by that? For like for a two attic unit, what would that mean? This a yes. minus one over two. It's a very good question. I'm I'm glad you asked it because it does require some commentary to to say what this means. Thank you. So. Um, so A is, if you have a two attic unit, then what you know about, well, you have the two attic integers mapped to Z mod two Z uh, by reduction mod two. Uh, it's a ring homomorphism. So if you have a two attic unit, so if you have a unit in this ring, it gives you a, uh, a unit in this ring, um, Z mod two Z cross. Uh, and the only, so that's just saying the unit units mod two is just one, right? So in other words, being a unit, and it's actually if and only if, um, by Hensel's, a version of Hensel's lemma. If you're a unit mod two, then you're a two attic unit. So uh, saying you're a two attic unit is exactly the same thing as saying you're congruent to one modulo two in this ring Z2. So it's the same thing as saying that if you take, uh, you know, X minus one, you can divide it by two and you still get a two attic integer. Now, again, we use this homomorphism from Z2 to Z mod two Z. So we can extract a sign not just out of any integer, but also out of any two attic integer. So, or an even odd criterion, so to speak. Um, and then that, so this makes sense as an element in Z mod 2Z, and that is, allows you to make sense of all of this nonsense here. Was that a, a coherent explanation? Uh, yeah, I, I think I get it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, and, uh, you know, it's a similar, slightly more elaborate version of the same thing makes sense of this exponent as well. Any other questions? Okay. Um, right. Uh, ah, let me make another corollary of, of this remark. This is an important remark I said. Um, let me make another corollary of this remark. Uh, before we move on. Um, so this, if A and B are non-zero rational numbers, uh, then ABQP is equal to plus one for all but finitely many P. So 
So when you look at this equation, a, ax squared plus by squared equals z squared for any a and b, well, if you fix a and b, then for almost all the p addicts, it's, it's going to have um, it's going to have a non-trivial solution. Um, and what's the reason behind this? Well, uh, well, the claim I claim that in fact, if x is in q cross, uh, then the valuation of x is equal. The p-adic valuation of x is equal to zero for all but finitely many p. And this is because you know you write x as a quotient of integers, and then there's only finitely many primes appearing in both of those integers in the prime factorizations of both of those integers. And then for all primes different from those primes, uh, the p-adic valuation will be trivial. There's no p's to pull out um, either in the numerator or the denominator. And then that then applying this to both a and b, you'll get a finite list of primes occurring in both a and b. And when you're outside of that, you're a p-adic integer. So by this remark here, uh, the Hilbert symbol will be trivial. And this is the uh, this lets us state the uh, Hilbert reciprocity law or the Hilbert product formula, as it's also called. Um, so, so this is the theorem. Well, maybe I'll keep this up as best I can. Um, so. Called Hilbert reciprocity or Hilbert product formula. So, so let A and B be rational numbers. So we're trying to see how the different p-adic Hilbert symbols are related to each other. Um, and but for that to make sense, we have to start with something that maps to all the p-adic numbers for all p. So we start with a rational number. Um, and then it turns out we get a non-trivial relation between the p-adic Hilbert symbols for the various completions of Q. So if you take the real symbol and mar multiply it by the product over all P of the p-adic Hilbert symbols, um, then you get plus one. And well, so note that this infinite product reduces to a finite product. Uh, by the previous corollary. So you just have to, if, as long as you, if you, if you choose a prime P, which uh, is not in the prime factorizations of A and, and B and is not two, um, then you're guaranteed that the symbol will be trivial. So it's really only a finite product. Um, and in fact, you can say what this means very, con ah, yes, uh, and please tell me if I'm, please tell me if I'm mispronouncing your name, by the way, I don't, like, I don't know. No, no, name. that's, you're saying it correctly. And thanks okay. for asking. I, I wanted to ask, so would this, I mean, we, we, we're not, I guess we're gonna see the proof in a minute, but I was wondering, would this formula be related to the product formula for the norms? That if I have a, I mean, if I have a rational number, then the product formula over all the norms, QP, where we also consider P at infinity to be, well, the usual absolute value is equal to one. Indeed, it's very much related. So they belong to the same family of theorems. There's no logical connection between them, but they belong to the same family of theorems. This one is uh, much more complicated. So that we are not going to see the proof in just a moment in, in particular. It's going to take us a while to, I mean, we might get to it at the end of the lecture, but uh, it, it's not something we can just state and then automatically prove. It requires some buildup. Uh, so this is, it, it is of exactly the same general nature, but it is, on the other hand, a, level of complication above. Mm -hmm. Thank yep. you. Dustin. Yes. Sorry, I don't know how to make my hand raise, but oh. could I return to a more mundane question related yeah. to Eleftherios's previous question? So if you yeah. just scroll up a little bit. Uh, scroll up, so to speak, yeah. Mm -hmm. Back to your uh, a minus one over two. A yeah. is a p-adic integer. So if you have the two-adic expansion of a, that means yeah. that the constant term is is now zero when you take a minus one. Correct. But when you divide that by two, do you just shift that um, shift expansion one to the left? Exactly, you shift the digits one to the, I guess well, one expansion. to the lower power of, of two. Yeah, you divide by two in the p-adic expansion, in the two Which is just to shift. In, right. the, in terms of okay. the digits, shifts in whichever direction that you correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, All right, thank, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, you guys, please do feel free to interrupt me with questions because um, the only undergraduate classes I've taught recently have been calculus for chemistry students. So I'm not used to, <laughs> um, I, I'm 
I'm not used to this. So please, it helps me out a lot to know how to how to explain things the more questions you guys ask. Um, uh, okay. Um, where was I? I was in the middle of saying something. Ah, yes. So I was going to say that, well, this, I mean, this looks really fancy, right? An infinite product. But if you think back to the definition of the Hilbert symbols, this can be rephrased in a very concrete way. So concretely, it doesn't help proving it, but at least you can phrase it helps phrasing it. Um, so, so concretely, if you can look at this uh, equation, ax squared plus, uh, so uh, by squared equals z e squared. Um, so uh, it, uh, the set of uh, completions of two, uh, in which this equation has a non-trivial solution is, well, first of all, finite. That's the remark we made earlier about the Hilbert symbol being plus one for all but finally many p. Um, but then what is the Hilbert reciprocity set saying? It's saying that this finite number of completions of Q in which this equation has a non-trivial solution is an even number. Do you mean right? it does not have a non-trivial solution? Uh, I mean, this the thing I said in the definition of the Hilbert symbol. So a, a solution which is different from zero, zero, zero. So uh, X equals Y equals Z equals zero is what we call the trivial solution to this equation. Because uh, you know any equation like this you write down is going to have is a homo any homogeneous equation is always going to have zero 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 as a solution. So we call that one trivial. We say we're not interested in that. We're only interested in non-trivial ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, I guess I meant to ask if you meant to say that there's an even number where there is only the trivial solution. It's so like most uh, of the time it's a non-trivial one, but then. No. Uh, no. I think I said it right. Okay. It's okay. It's possible maybe, I got screwed maybe. up. So let me double check. Um, so the Hilbert symbol, let me go back to the sheet of paper where I define the Hilbert symbol. Yeah. Okay. So the Hilbert symbol, we want to know when it's minus one. That's, oh, wait, blah, blah. <laughs> Did I? Uh, no, I, you're right. I got it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, has, has, uh, wait, okay. Where am I? Okay, now I'm getting myself all confused. So the Hilbert symbol is plus one if this has a, yes, it does not have a, have, okay, that, see, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's a double negative, which is gonna be my excuse for getting confused, but thank you very much for correcting me. Um, and sorry for giving the wrong answer first. Um, yes, um, does not have a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Does not have a non-trivial solution. It's finite and even. And that's just because if you have a bunch of signs and if you want their product to be plus one, then the number of minus signs has to be even, right? Um, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. And by the way, it's it's. I mean, it's it's really annoying to have to always separate out the real numbers and the p-adic numbers. So I want to also use uniform notation. And let me switch to. I'll write new for what's called a place of the rational numbers. And a place is either a prime number P or this another thing, which you can think of as corresponding to the usual absolute value on the rational numbers. So, um, and, uh, and then for every place, we can write a Q sub, a place nu, we can write Q sub nu for the corresponding completion. So Q sub nu is QP if nu is a so-called finite place, a place P prime number p and it's r if mu is the other place, uh, the so-called infinite place. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I just. Is, um, there, is there an analog of this um, Hilbert reciprocity for general number fields? Indeed there is. Um, and it works exactly the same. Um, well, uh, yeah, so you can, you can phrase, it, it, you can make a, yeah, it, it, yeah. So the every number field also has a set of places, completions. You can define a, a Hilbert symbol with values in plus or minus one and the same statement is true. It's actually not too difficult to reduce that statement to the case of the rational numbers. So there's not that much more content. But on the other hand, um, well, I'm about to explain that the Hilbert reciprocity is equivalent to the quadratic reciprocity law from elementary number theory. And, and actually, so while, while the translation from Q to a general number field is in some sense trivial in the Hilbert reciprocity formulation, in the quadratic reciprocity formulation is very much non-trivial. 
And this, and to phrase in a similarly, an elementary way, what you know, the quadratic or suppressed law is in an arbitrary number field is quite difficult. And this is one of the virtues of phrasing things in terms of the p addicts and so on, is that it's easier then to generalize to other number fields. The statements become easier to make and then just as easy to prove, really. but it, really the first part is the most crucial part. The statements are easy to make when you use this language of completions and so on. Um, and also I should say, when you move to a general number field, you can upgrade the Hilbert symbol to, you can always make it take values in the group of roots of unity in your number field, which is a finite um, cyclic group, which um, is oftentimes bigger than just plus or minus one. So you can also get a, yeah, so there's a, also a slight refinement. And there are a million other refinements, you know, Hilbert reciprocity is refined by art and reciprocity is refined by, you know, Langland's correspondence. I mean, the, the story never ends. The, the, the quadratic reciprocity law is a wellspring on much of modern number theory. Um, right. So, uh, can I, that sentence that starts with concretely, uh, some things are written uh, below, but there, can you read it one more time or clearly mark what goes where? Yes, absolutely. So that concretely, the set of completions of Q, actually, I just now introduced a new name for that. So play, I'll call them, I'm calling them places. So place is a equivalence class of absolute values. Um, so it corresponds to either a prime P or the other one. Um, the set of places of Q in which this equation does not have a non-trivial solution. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's finite and even. Um, does not have a non Well, anyway, I get confused trying to read the so, sentence. I wish, I wish you guys the best luck. <laughs> maybe, maybe another way is just say, if P is large enough, the prime is large enough, it always has a solution in QP. It always has a non yeah, non-trivial solution in QP. Right? Beyond some point and, and the ones that, <laughs> and then you have an even number before that where it doesn't. Where it does not, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on now. Um, all right. Um, so I want to explain now that the Hilbert reciprocity, oh wow. Is there, oh, the chat is just going wild, eh? Uh, ah, but Akil's, Akil's on it. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to use this Hilbert reciprocity law. I want to show that uh, the Hilbert reciprocity law implies the quadratic reciprocity law. So let me remind you of the quadratic. Well, actually, it'll just come out. So let's, let's uh, specialize. So we're allowed to take any non-zero rational numbers. So let's specialize to A equals P and B equals Q, where P and Q are distinct odd primes. And let's figure out what this Hilbert reciprocity is saying. So first of all, the Hilbert symbol P comma Q sub nu is always gonna be plus one um, unless nu is equal to either, uh, you know, P, um, Q two or you know the usual absolute value, um, which corresponds to the real numbers. Um, oh, I, what I was calling it Q mu. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay, now I'm now it's just embarrassing. Uh, if, if, if mu is not in this set, because then it then mu corresponds to an odd prime number, and P and Q it'll be an odd prime number distinct from P and Q. And therefore, both these numbers will be, uh, you know, mu attic integers, um, and so the, the Hilbert symbol is plus one. So uh, we only have to calculate what the Hilbert symbol is for these uh, four possibilities, and then read out what comes. So well, so first of all, p q uh, r is equal to plus one. Um, well, because p is positive or q is positive. Um, and what about in for two? So what is the two attic Hilbert symbol? Well, by the formula I wrote earlier, so P and Q are two attic integers, uh, two attic units. So this is the same thing as minus one to the P minus one over two, uh, Q minus one over two. Um, and then what about P, Q, uh, Q, P? Well, by another form, well, it doesn't, it's gonna be symmetric in uh, P and Q, the, the P, you know, the P attic Hilbert symbol is symmetric in both variables. So the same as QP, and I wrote down the formula for that. It's just Q on P, the Legendre symbol, because Q is a, a P attic unit. There are no P's in it. Um, and similarly, P, Q, 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 excuse me, is a P on Q. So then the quadratic, uh, sorry, the Hilbert 
product formula is saying that minus one to the P minus one over two, Q minus one over two times Q on P times P on Q is equal to plus one. Um, and now these are all signs. So uh, I can sort of, when I cancel them by dividing by them, it's the same as multiplying by them. So I could, if I want, I can move this over minus one to the P minus one over two, Q minus one over two. And then we get one of the standard formulations of the quadratic reciprocity law. Um, so in other words, well, what, is this, what does this function look like? This is equal to plus one, uh, but uh, unless P and Q are both congruent to three mod four, in which case it's minus one. So concretely, and this, this, these are signs which tell you whether Q is a square mod P or P is a square mod Q. So concretely, what this is saying is that P is a square mod Q if and only if Q is a square mod P, unless they're both three mod four, in which case it's opposite. So P is a square mod Q if and only if Q is not a square mod P. And in the problem sets, one, the first problem will be about you know, using this to extract sort of concrete criteria, for example, for when 13 is a square module and odd prime, um, which is kind of, Fun, fun elementary number theory sort of stuff to work out from quadratic reciprocity if you've never, um, never thought about that before. Um, okay, but we can actually get more than this. This doesn't just have quadratic reciprocity. It also contains the two so-called supplementary laws for quadratic reciprocity. So there's something quadratic reciprocity doesn't tell you anything about the prime two. Um, and it also doesn't tell you anything about signs. So plus and minus one. So so Hilbert reciprocity also gives uh, that minus one on P is minus one to the P minus one over two. Uh, so again, so P is again an odd prime. Uh, and two on P is equal to minus one to the P squared minus one over eight. So it gives the, also the criterion for whether minus one is a square mod P and whether two is a square mod P. And since it also tells you when Q is a square mod P for an odd prime Q, it can be used to tell you when anything is a square mod P because the Legendre symbol is a homomorphism. So you understand it on any number if you understand it on prime numbers and minus one. Um, right. Uh, and that, so this, you, for this, you can plug in, um, you know, A equals minus one and B equals P. And for this, you can plug in A equals two and B equals P. Uh, so I'll leave that also as an in, informal exercise. It's not on the exercise sheet, but um, yeah. Okay. So any questions about the statement of the Hilbert reciprocity law or the deduction of quadratic reciprocity from it? No. Okay. Now I'm going to present to you a proof of quadratic reciprocity of Hilbert reciprocity, which. I kind of dislike, but it's quite beautiful. Um, uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll sketch the proof and then I'll tell you why I dislike it. Um, but it, um, so we're going to give a Tate's proof um, of Hilbert reciprocity. I mean, I like it too, <laughs> uh, but there's one reason I dislike it for. Um, and I'm going to just, it, it, it takes, it consists in two steps, and I'm not going to go into details about either of these two steps. This is just to give you a preliminary idea of how, of the logical structure of the proof. Um, so for step one, we have these Hilbert symbols, right? But, and, but in Akhil's lecture, he also introduced the general notion of a symbol, um, certain bilinear map on F, on, this, on a field, a certain bilinear map on F cross uh, to a target abelian group. Um, and Tate's proof, the first step in Tate's proof is to classify all symbols uh, for, the, for the field F equals Q. So you can think of these, well, the, the, this, this Hilbert symbol started life as a symbol over QP, but you can restrict it to Q and just as well view it as a symbol on Q. So all of these things are symbols on Q. And if you understand all possible symbols on Q, then you'll actually be able to deduce, and we'll see this in just a second, that there must be some relation between uh, this symbol and these symbols. This is the real Hilbert symbol and the p Hilbert symbols for various prime P. 
So I guess maybe step 1.5 is deduce some relation of the form. Uh, so product over all places mu of a b mu to some epsilon mu is equal to plus one, where epsilon mu is either uh, uh, zero or one. So there must be some, when, when we, after you classify all symbols, you're gonna deduce that there must be some relation between the various Hilbert symbols for the various places. But you don't, you can't deduce what the relation is if, just from the classification. But then in, in step two, you, you see that, you prove that the only possible relation of that type is the desired one. So, so all of these places have to be contributing. So all of these ep uh, epsilon v's, epsilon mu's have to be plus one. And then the, the relation that you abstractly have necessarily, so I was saying the only possible relation is the one that gives Hilbert reciprocity. And that's the proof of Hilbert reciprocity. Very, very, very weird. You deduce there must be some relation and then by various number theoretic trickery, you prove that the relation has to be this one. Yes, question. Oh, thank you. So I was wondering, looking at that Hilbert formula, it, are there like, it's kind of a general question maybe and a bit vague, are there like any cases where we know the value of the Hilbert symbol for say all places except one and we can use this formula to like find that, that place where we don't know the Hilbert symbol? That is, I would say, perhaps the major applica concrete application of Hilbert reciprocity indeed. That is what it's telling you, yeah? If you know the value of that, that's a, a very good remark. If you know, another way of saying this Hilbert reciprocity is if you know the value of the Hilbert symbol at all except one place, then, you, then the value at that missing place is indeed determined and in a, in a precise manner, yeah? Thank you. And Thank it will, it, we will be using it in exactly this way in one of the coming lectures. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Paul. You're, you're muted. Uh, still muted? Now, <laughs> yeah, sorry. At the bottom of the page that you have displayed, um, yes. it oh, seems- no. That was it. Oh no, where did it go? That, where Hilbert's reciprocity is. Oh, the, where the statement is or this- Where the here? statement of Hilbert reciprocity, yeah, that page. At the bottom yeah. of that page, you seem to be saying that the real, Hilbert symbol of A and B is one plus one, but I thought it was minus one if both are negative. A and B. Where am I? No, 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 no. This is a change in notation. So that I'm changing from oh, P oh, to oh. Mu. And mu I includes, see. so includes, includes is something called infinity or whatever yes, you want to yes. call it, for which Q right. new, uh, uh, yes. Q new is equal to R. Thank so you. I'm just restating it. I'm not adding any mathematical content. Okay, sorry. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, right. Um, so now I wanna make a, so I can tell we're probably not gonna get through the proof today, but I left some wiggle room in my lecture planning, so that's okay. Um, so let me just remind you again about the concept of symbol. And then deduce the interesting uh, bookkeeping device of the universal symbol, um, which turns out to have quite a lot of significance. Um, so, well, let me just recall the definition that Akil gave. Um, so if F is a field and A is an abelian group, which we're gonna write multiplicatively, uh, somewhat unusual, uh, somewhat unusually, but in, in all the examples, it's gonna be naturally a multiplicative group. So it'd be too confusing to use additive notation for the general case. Um, uh, so uh, a symbol or otherwise it's sometimes known as a Steinberg symbol, if you wanna be very precise about it uh, on F with values in A uh, is a function. So a set theoretic function, just a map of sets from F cross cross F cross to A such that uh, there are two properties satisfied. And one is that it's bilinear in each variable where you remember that all 
all these are abelian groups under multiplication. So uh, I'll call this map phi. So it's such that phi of a, b, comma, c is phi of a, comma, c times phi of b, comma, c. And then in the same other variable as well, a, comma, b, c equals phi of a, comma, b times phi of a, comma, c. And the second property is the so-called Steinberg relation. So phi of a, comma, b equals one uh, if a plus b is equal to one and, and a and b are in f plus. Um, <coughs> right. Um, so, and the examples that we had, uh, um, uh, the Hilbert symbol. So uh, on any Q mu, uh, the Hilbert symbol is a symbol uh, with values uh, in, plus, in the group of signs plus or minus one. Um, but note, so let me make a remark. Uh, if, you know, if um, F goes to E is a homomorphism of fields, Call this F, little f, uh, and phi is a symbol on E. Then, well, phi composed with F, you know, F, in, uh, F applied to each variable separately, I mean, um, is a symbol uh, on F. And that's just because we only use fields, I mean, we only use addition and multiplication to phrase all these properties. And so it's a, it's a routine check to see that this holds. So, uh, we, so we can also view the Hilbert symbol, the QV Hilbert symbol um, uh, also restricts uh, to a symbol on Q. So all of these different um, Hilbert symbols for the different places can be viewed as symbols, they start life as symbols on Q nu, but you can, you can view them as symbols, just as symbols on Q. And that's what we're gonna do from now on. Um, but let me also uh, make a slight elaboration of the Hilbert symbol, at least at odd primes. So let's go back to the formula for the Hilbert symbol um, for odd, uh, yeah, for odd primes. Nope, can't find it. So let me write it again. Uh, so, and so another example, well, um, for a P and odd prime, well, it doesn't have to be odd. So for P a prime, uh, there is this a uh, there is a tame symbol, so-called tame symbol, uh, um, which I will denote uh, so a tame symbol on Q, uh, a b sub p, and this will be defined to be a minus one to the v p p-adic valuation of a times the p-adic valuation of b uh, multiplied by you take a to the p-adic valuation of b. Uh, divided by b to the p-adic valuation of a, and then you reduce that mod p. Um, so it's the same thing as the formula for the Hilbert symbol. Uh, and it's, what it, where does it take values? It takes values in fp cross. Um, so it's the same thing as the Hilbert form symbol for an odd prime p, except that you don't take the Legendre symbol at the very end. You just reduce mod p, and that's it. And you remember it as an element in fp cross, or z mod p z cross. Um, and the same, re the same reasoning for why the Hilbert symbol at an odd prime is a symbol will prove to you that the tame symbol is a, a symbol. So the, the, the Legendre symbol had no, played no role in that argument. And you're, you're actually going to see an abstract version of this in your exercises. So you'll go over why this kind of thing always defines a symbol. Um, yeah, so indeed it doesn't define a symbol with values in this uh, group of units in this finite field. Now, of course, for p equals two, this is trivial because F2 cross is a trivial group. So you just get a trivial symbol. Um, so this is only interesting when p is an odd prime, um, but it exists of course also when p equals two. There's nothing preventing you from taking p equals two here. So this is, a, but when p is odd, it's more refined than the Hilbert symbol, right? Okay. Um, so now, uh, so this, this gives a, now a wealth of symbols on the rational numbers. And Tate's classification is gonna say that essentially we've written down all examples up to, up to uh, well, 
trivial modifications, but how do we make that precise? So, so I claim so I'm, there's a there's there's this artifice of the universal symbol, which um, so. Um, Just some weird formal game that you can play that actually turns out to be useful. So, so uh, set A to be the free abelian group on uh, symbols. Well, now that's a that's a bad word to use. On on F cross cross F cross on this set, uh, uh, subject to the following relations. So, or modulo the subgroup generated by. Uh, everything that makes the Steinberg property and the bimultiplicativity hold. So, um, you know, A, B, C. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the standard. So, it's the free abelian group on this set. So, I should be writing it comma uh, A, B, comma C. But unfortunately, the standard notation. <laughs> Is to use these uh, these things instead when you're talking about. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll write it in terms of the standard thing. So, uh, ah, no, ah, shoot, sorry, guys. Uh, a b comma c uh, is equal to a comma c or sorry, times. Um, uh, so and then a b c equals a b inverse a c inverse and a b equals one for a plus B equals one. Okay, so you simply take the so, free. So, uh, hmm, what? Uh, what? For the second relation, do we mean to have an equal sign there, or? Um, oh, thank you. No, sorry. So it's supposed to be times. Yes, thank you. The so product in your group. Yeah. So I want to make the A B comma C equal to A C comma B C. So I have to mod out by the mod out by the subgroup generated by these things, and then I want to. Uh, also include the subgroup generated by these things. Thank you. I was getting myself confused in the way I was writing it down. Yep. Um, so then, what does this give you? So then, uh, well, th this 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 particular a uh, is denoted by. So it's a, it it only depends on the field f, right? So it's an abelian group you can define for any field, free abelian group generated by this set subject to these relations. So it's a functor of the field. Um, so it, it depends only on the field, and it's denoted by k two f, um, hinting, of course, that there are also k i f uh, for all i. Okay. Um, but we're not going to go into that. So we're just we happen to be interested in the k two group. It's the one that's relevant for us. So that's the only one we're going to talk about. Um, so. This is this K two F is it is the target of the universal symbol. So what does that mean? So, so there is a symbol on F with values in A, uh, values in K two F uh, defined by uh, so A comma B maps to the image of A comma B uh, in its quotient in in the quotient uh, which defines K two of F. And this image is usually uh, written uh, as curly braces a comma b. So that doesn't mean the set consisting of a and b in this context. It means the image of of this uh, these, this generator a comma b uh, in your generating set for your abelian group uh, when you mod out by the relations which you which you've uh, used to define it. Um, and this symbol is is universal. Uh, so moreover. Um, there is a bijection uh, between symbols on F with values in A, an arbitrary abelian group A, uh, and homomorphisms of abelian groups uh, from K2 of F to A. And so I was using, yeah, so A is no longer the specific thing, which I now call K2 of F. A is now a general abelian group. So for now, an arbitrary abelian group, us giving a simple enough of values in A is just the same thing as giving a homomorphism from the specific abelian group. And the bijection is given by composing with the universal symbol. So, uh, so if you have such a homomorphism, then you have your symbol here with values in K2F, 
if you apply this homomorphism, uh, you compose with this homomorphism, you get a symbol of values in A. So that defines the map in this direction. And to go backwards, you just use the definition of K2 of F. So by definition, it's the free of group on F cross cross F cross subject to some relations. And so you can give a homomorphism out of it when you just specify the value on the gen values on the generators. Um, as long as the relations are satisfied and the relations exactly say that you have a symbol. So in the end, this is one big tautology. Uh, yes, uh, there is. So this universal thing in the name revert, it, does it come from like this universal property kind of thing that you mentioned for the homomorphism? Is this the universality it refers to? Yes, indeed. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's the initial object in some category. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can make a category of symbols on a fixed field of F, uh, where the homomorphisms are sort of given by homomorphisms, you know, but where the morphisms are given by homomorphisms of target abelian groups. And K2F is the uh, initial object in that category. So it satisfies a precise universal property if you, if you like the category of theoretic terminology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Paul? Yeah, um, I'm just noting that there's no statement about symmetry of the symbols in the two no, variables. Indeed. No, indeed. So Akhil showed in, when he was talking about symbols that the version of symmetry that holds for an arbitrary symbol, it's not quite obvious, but it's also, but it is elementary, um, is that phi A B equals phi B A inverse. Ah. So if you're taking values in a group where every element has order two, or in other words, an, it's the same thing as giving an F2 vector space, then it's the same as symmetry, but otherwise it's different. Thank you. And Indeed, you can see that these tame symbols in general are not uh, symmetric, but they are anti-symmetric. Um, right. Um, to finish up, let me state uh, Tate's calculation of K2 of Q. So, yeah. Theorem. Tate. Um, K2 of Q is isomorphic to, well, here's the way Milner writes it, A2 direct sum A3 direct sum A5. So it's a direct sum over prime numbers of certain finite abelian groups, where A2 is the group of signs, and AP is a Z mod PZ cross uh, for P on. And you know, this isomorphism uh, sends uh, a, B, two, you know, the, the two adic Hilbert symbol, uh, then the three adic Hilbert symbol, uh, sorry, then the, the tame symbol, uh, A, B, three, A, B, five, et cetera. So you use the two adic Hilbert symbol when the tame symbol is trivial, and then otherwise for odd primes, you just use the tame symbol. Um, so, and this classifies all symbols, right? Because, so if you know what the universal symbol is, then you know what all the symbols are. Because giving now a symbol on Q is the same thing as giving a homomorphism out of this group. This is a direct sum, so that's the same as giving a homomorphism out of each factor. So you, and that's, these are all cyclic, finite cyclic groups. So it's just giving an element of a certain order in your target abelian group. And in the next lecture, we'll prove Tate's theorem and explain how to deduce um, Hilbert reciprocity from it. So, um, sorry, oh. uh, once we, once we showed Tate's uh, theorem, um, uh, can we then say, uh, sorry, if I'm asking a simple algebra question, I just forget my algebra sometimes. Um, is the, uh, is the only homomorphism from K2 into like a P, um, the, the, the one that sends a P like the, the a P to itself and everything else to zero. No, no, that no, it's not. So, um, it is a very good question. So it's, I, I said Tate's theorem says, you know, these are basically all the symbols. That is not correct liter as a literal statement. So you really have to analyze. Oh, okay. So for example, um, you know, let's look at symbols with values in A2. Oh, sorry, I stopped my screen share. Well, let's do, let's do it in our brains, right? So let's look at symbols with values in A2. It's the same thing as a symbol with value in plus or minus one. We know plenty of those. At, for every odd prime, you also get a symbol with values in plus or minus one. So you really can't have a lot of cross terms. So you really have, just have to okay. take your target abelian group as an abstract abelian group and ask for all homomorphisms from A2, all homomorphisms from A3, 
all homomorphisms from A5, and you can choose these and combine them together to get an arbitrary symbol with values in A. So I'll explain this sense. in Thank more you. detail in the next slide. You're welcome. Yeah. In Tate's proof, is he also going to vary A? No, we're just gonna now, for now on, all the complexity of the possible target group is just contained in the definition of this one K2, K2 group. So we're only gonna be, from now on in Tate's theorem, we're just gonna be looking at K2, defined by generators and relations. And we'll prove that that group defined by those generators and relations is isomorphic to this direct sum. And we won't yeah, talk but, about, uh, yes. Uh, what I intended to ask was, uh, so we the definition of symbols, uh, we have this uh, map from F cross F to A. So, and uh, in the first step of uh, Tate's proof, you wrote down Tate classifies all of the uh, symbols possible. So in that thing, is he going to allow A? Uh, that's what I intended to ask. Yes, indeed. So okay. that's step one does correspond to this theorem of Tate's giving, okay. describing this group K to a Q up to isomorphism. So describing all symbols on a field is exactly the same thing as describing the group K2 of the field. Yeah, because we said uh, there will be, uh, the symbols will correspond to homomorphisms from K2 of the Precisely. So, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. So I've, I've said the same thing in a different language. In step one, classifying all symbols is the same as this step one, determining the group K2 of Q. That's the, that's the virtue of this kind of universal nonsense. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, just so. Oh, can I uh, can I ask uh, a question? Uh, yes, please. So I was I, I was thinking a bit about this uh, with regards to the question I asked you a, a while ago about this uh, universal property. So what would this like? I, I'm just curious about what this category of symbols would look like. I'm not sure that I. I got what how you explained the 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 morphisms in that category because I'm I'm a bit curious about what that category of symbols over a field of a field would uh, would look like. Well, I mean, I, I just made up a category. I'm, I'm not thinking. You, I'm not saying you really <laughs> think about this category. I'm just I sort of, I just made one up on the spot. I guess I don't know. I mean, a symbol. So a symbol. The objects are the symbols, right? And a map. I think this is what I want to say. A map between two symbols is just a map between the target abelian groups. Which makes the diagram commute. So, like, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, that that would, yeah. I I I see it. I get it. I can I can think about that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm not saying you're going to want to go and study this category. I mean, it's just the other. Way. I just wanted to give a formal meaning to mm -hmm. saying the universal. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Dustin. And then uh, I have, oh, so there's a question? No, it was me saying my pleasure. Um, oh, okay. No pleasure. And, uh, so there, I have office hours right now, and then there are um, TA sessions and there's a cross program. And then see you to all tomorrow.